The word meditation means different things in different cultures. In Buddhist meditation, we talk about bhavana. Bhavana means mental training or mental development. So the practice is divided into two kinds. There is samatha and vipassana. Samatha meditation is usually translated as calming or tranquility meditation. And vipassana is usually translated as insight meditation. The practice of samatha meditation was already known prior to the time of the Buddha. After he left the palace at the age of 29, he went to two meditation teachers, Alaraka Lama and Uddhaka Ramaputta. They both taught a samatha practice and they attained very high states of concentration. What they lacked was wisdom, understanding. So they thought that their states of, of uh, concentration were the highest possible attainments. But it was the Buddha who struck out independently of them and eventually he discovered the practice we call vipassana. So it is vipassana meditation which is unique to Buddhism, as far as I know. The practice of samatha meditation is done by giving the mind an object and trying to, to deepen the concentration on that object. What results from this is a calming or tranquilizing of the mind. In its undisciplined state, the mind is like a monkey. It jumps all over the place. Up, down, along, backwards, upwards, downwards again. If you look at your mind for a few moments, you will see thoughts arise and pass away very rapidly, often in a well, apparently haphazard, disorganized fashion. If you can deepen your concentration on one particular object, that has a calming effect on the mind. The more you can concentrate on one object, the less possible it is for the mind to go charging off with other objects, particularly worries, anxieties, fears, other negative states of mind. So the practice of samatha meditation is done in order to calm or tranquilize the mind. When it is carried out successfully to a very powerful degree, it is possible to attain states which are called jhana. J-H-A-N-A. -A. Jhana does not have a really good English translation. Sometimes it's translated as absorption. But then, of course, you ask, what is an absorption? So, these jhanic states are extremely pure states of mind. Very pleasant states of mind. And for a temporary period, 
the mind is purified. Negative qualities are suspended and <clears throat> wholesome qualities are developed. But the state of jhana is not a permanent condition. That is a disadvantage, that is a problem. With jhana, you may experience very peaceful, very happy, very pure states of mind, but they, they don't last. Eventually, the state of jhana comes to an end. So the Buddha talked about Ditta Dhamma Sukha Vihara, happy living in the present moment. So the state, <coughs> the, the practice of Samatha meditation is a very good training for the mind. But if you want to find permanent happiness, that will only come by the attainment of the state of Nibbana through the practice of Vipassana meditation. We have here a copy of the Satipatthana Sutta. This is a comprehensive set of instructions from the Buddha on how to practice meditation. Before we get into that, I have a few preliminary remarks. First, the Buddhist path is usually presented starting with ethical conduct. That means getting your bodily and verbal actions under control. And in the Noble Eightfold Path we have right speech, right action, right livelihood. They are important foundations for the path. If you practice right speech, right action, right livelihood, then you have laid down for yourself peace of mind. There'll be no regrets, no thoughts of, oh dear, I wish I hadn't done that. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry I said that. So, if you can establish an ethical basis to your life, then you have a good foundation on which to develop the mind. So that is why emphasis is placed on right conduct. Now the practice of samatha meditation can be done by taking one of 40 different objects. Some objects are suitable only for people of one particular temperament or disposition. And if somebody is undertaking serious practice of meditation, then his teacher will study the way he goes about his life study the way he walks, how he eats, how he dresses, how he sweeps the floor, etc., etc., in order to be able to judge the meditator's temperament. And then a suitable object can be given to somebody of that particular temperament. There are, however, some objects which are suitable for people of any temperament. The most commonly practiced is anapanasati. That is mindfulness 
of the in-breathing and mindfulness of the out-breathing. We'll look at this in a bit more detail when we get into the sutta. <clears throat> but that is only one of the possible objects which can be taken. But it is, uh, I think, the most widely practiced one. It was used by the Buddha on the night he attained enlightenment. So, if it was good enough for him, it's good enough for the rest of us. Let's take a look then at this sutta, the Satipatthana Sutta. Usually translated into English as the four foundations of mindfulness. I'm not sure that the word foundation is quite suitable. It's not that these four areas generate mindfulness. It is that we may generate mindfulness by addressing these four areas. There are four things. Body, feelings, mind, and mental objects. These are four subjects about which we can develop mindfulness. The Buddha gives in this sutta an explanation of both samatha meditation and vipassana meditation. You can't be mindful of all of the objects mentioned at the same time. So you have to be selective. And you can choose what particular object you like to be mindful of, depending on where you are, the situation in which you find yourself, etc., etc. If we look at the beginning of the sutta, it starts with the words, thus have I heard. This is the standard beginning with Venerable Ananda speaking to the monks assembled at the first council three months after the Buddha passed away. And he is saying, this is what I, Ananda, heard the Buddha say. The Blessed One was once living among the Kurus at Kamasa Dhamma, a market town of the Kuru people. The Kurus were reckoned to be intelligent people. The Buddha gave them some important discourses, of which this is only one. And it seems that they were receptive to his teaching. So there the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus and spoke as follows. Bhikkhu, in the Buddhist context, it means an ordained monk. But it can be used in a wider sense to describe more generally followers of the Buddha. So he's not necessarily talking to ordained monks here. And he starts off with the statement this is the only way, bhikkhus, for the purification of beings, for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the destruction 
of suffering and grief, for reaching the right path, for the attainment of Nibbāna. If you can remember the Buddha's first sermon, in which he defines the word dukkha. He talks about sorrow, lamentation, suffering, grief, etc. So this is his um, solution to the problem. Now there is some discussion about the use of the word only. This is the only way. That sounds rather dogmatic. And some people prefer to translate it as direct rather than only. It's a single way. It doesn't branch off. And it leads to only one destination, enlightenment. And the Buddha is talking here about this practice which, if, if, you, if you look at it and practice it diligently, this will be your direct path to the state of enlightenment. The four foundations of mindfulness. There is a, a school of thought that says that each foundation is it, it's a progressive sequence. Each foundation leads on to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. But other teachers say, maybe, but you can still practice the foundations without necessarily having to start with the first foundation before you go on to the second foundation. So, here's the Buddha saying, this is the right path for the attainment of Nibbana, namely the four foundations of mindfulness. What are the four? Here. A bhikkhu. Here means the Buddha is speaking from his own standpoint as an enlightened being. Here, a bhikkhu. Ardent. Clearly comprehending things. and mindful. We need to look here at a couple of words. Ardent. Ardent means making an effort continuously. The Buddha said that nothing is attained anywhere unless you make effort. It's not just on following his teaching, but most things you don't attain unless you make an effort. So that is the first quality which has to be developed. Clearly comprehending things and mindful. There are two words. Sati and Sampajanya. Sati is translated as mindful. The root of the word really comes about from a verb which means to remember. And by paying attention to what you are doing in the present moment, you will be able to remember what you did. When you can't remember if you turned off the light before you went out, 
That is because you didn't turn the light off mindfully. If you, if you exercise mindfulness, you can be aware of what you were doing. You can go back in your memory. So sati is being aware of what is taking place in the present moment. Not what took place earlier today or yesterday. Not thinking about what is going to happen later. It is watching what is going on here and now. And it's a particular kind of watching. It's watching non-judgmentally, just observing. We sometimes talk about bare attention. You're paying attention. That's all you're doing, you're watching. Um, normally, we pass judgment on things that we are aware of. Good, bad, nice, nasty, like it, don't like it, etc., etc. In mindfulness practice, we are simply looking. Sometimes called choiceless awareness. So we are aware, but we don't make choices. This is a good thing, that's a bad thing. It's just observation. So the practice of mindfulness means being in the present moment. And you can't be mindful of everything at the same time. So I said that these Satipatthana Sutta, where it gives you lots and lots of objects, you have to choose which object to be mindful of at any one particular time. And it says also here that Clearly comprehending. The word is sampajanya. Put it on the board there. Sampajanya is to understand whatever it is that you are mindful of, you also become, you can also develop understanding of what it is. Specifically, it is, it is understanding of the three characteristics of existence, which is what we looked at last week, anicca, dukkha, anatta. Uh, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and no self. So whatever we choose to take as the object we can develop understanding that it has these three characteristics. So the Buddha starts off with the bhikkhu lives observing the activities of the body having overcome covetousness and repugnance towards the world of body. That is the first Satipatthana. Observing feelings, having overcome covetousness and repugnance towards the world of feelings. That is the second Satipatthana. Observing the activities of the mind, having overcome covetousness and repugnance towards the world of mind, that is the third Satipatthana, and observing mental objects, having overcome covetousness and repugnance towards the world of mental objects. That is the fourth Satipatthana. Now, before we 
launch into this particular practice. I just want to say a few words about the 40 objects which can be taken. On the board there you have a little list. The first 10 are called kasina. Kasina means a device. And it is a device which is made in order to act as a focus for your concentration. So that awareness of other objects is excluded. So these are used as devices to deepen the concentration. The next ten are called Asuba. These are objects of uh, I don't really want to use the word dislike or, or repugnance, but as we shall see, they are typically um, the body, a dead body in various stages of decay. Then we have ten anusati, ten recollections, one of which is anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing. Then we have four Brahma Vihara, Four divine abodes, four heavenly dwelling places. The Buddha said there are four qualities. If we can develop these in our life now, then we can live as if we are divine beings, as if we are gods. Loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic or appreciative joy, and equanimity. Then we have the four, they're called Arupa Jhana. Rupa is a material thing. Arupa is non-material. If you have still your chart of the 31 planes of existence, you will note that the top four are called formless or non-material jhanas. So they can be objects for meditation. The next one is the repulsive nature of food. This is a particular technique for dealing with Greed, gluttony, attachment to food. If this is developed, you understand that basically the food is actually not quite so attractive as you think it really is. And so that can deal with that form of attachment. And then the, the 40th one is the four elements which make up all material things. Solidity, fluidity, heat and motion. We shall encounter some of these as we go through this sutta. So, if we look at section one, the body. How does a bhikkhu live observing the activities of the body? And now, the object taken is breathing. Here are bhikkhus. A bhikkhu having gone to the forest, to the foot of a tree or to some empty place, sits down with his legs crossed, keeps his body straight and his mindfulness alert. This is the one practice for which the Buddha did talk about a specific posture. Other practices he doesn't. But here he says, um, you go to the foot of a tree or to some empty place or into the forest. The commentary says that 
that means you are 500 bow lengths away from the village. It's not easy to do that kind of thing in the middle of London. So it means just finding somewhere which is reasonably peaceful and you will not be disturbed. So you can practice in your own home. Try if you can, however, to arrange things so that you will not be disturbed during your practice. And he says, sits down with his legs crossed, keeping his body straight. And we have plenty of images around here of how to sit. The cross-legged posture is a very good posture because it is stable and if you are able to hold it for some time that is, that is the best posture to have. However, for many people trying to get into something even approximating that kind of posture is very painful. Uh, if, if we're not used to adopting that kind of posture then it's much better to sit on a chair. Nothing wrong with sitting on a chair providing you don't choose a comfortable chair. So you don't sit in a nice soft armchair where you will go to sleep. And you don't use the back of the chair to support your own back. So you need to sit a little bit far forward on the chair with your back uh, straight and then your mindfulness will be alert. Ever mindful he breathes in and ever mindful he breathes out. You are not trying to control your breathing. It may speed up, it may slow down, it may be deep, it may be shallow. That's quite unimportant. You're just trying to be aware of it. And you will need a spot, a place, where you can sense this breathing taking place. And the most commonly used place is the tip of the nose, the nostrils, the upper lip, or sometimes a little bit higher up in the nose. The exact spot is a question for you to experiment because everyone has a different shaped nose. But when you try breathing in and out, sometimes it's helpful just to hold your finger under your nose as you breathe in and out. You should find a little spot somewhere around here where the air flowing in is experienced as a cooling sensation and the air flowing out is experienced as a warming sensation. So you are observing cooling and warming, cooling and warming. And you can note, breathing in a long breath, he knows I am breathing in a long breath. Breathing out a long breath, he knows I'm breathing out a long breath. Breathing in a short breath, he knows I'm breathing in a short breath. Breathing out a short breath, he knows I'm breathing out a short breath. So there's no control being exercised here, there's simply observation. No attempt to deepen the breathing or to make it more coarse or more subtle. You're just watching it. Experiencing the whole breath body. I shall breathe in. 
This is open to different interpretations, but many people take this to mean the whole breath body, means being aware of the entire cycle of one inhalation and one exhalation, noting when the inhalation starts, when there's first contact between air and nostril, that's the beginning. Noting then the middle part, the flowing of the air in, and noting the ending of the in-breath. So there are three phases. You don't deliberately chop up the breathing into three phases, but you can be aware. Beginning, middle, end. And then there's a short pause, and then you are aware when the exhalation starts. The beginning of the exhalation, the flowing out of the exhalation, and the ending of the exhalation. And another little pause before the next inhalation starts. So that is the whole breath body. One cycle of inhalation and exhalation. Thus he trains himself. Now the preceding paragraph talked about he breathes in, he breathes out, he knows I'm breathing in, he knows I'm breathing out. But here we're getting down to a bit more serious work. This is, he trains himself. So this is a more active application. Thus he trains himself. Experiencing the whole breath body, I shall breathe out. Thus he trains himself. And then calming the activity of the breath body, I shall breathe in. Thus he trains himself. Calming the activity of the breath body, I shall breathe out. Thus he trains himself. That is also open to different interpretations. But it's not so much a question of trying to calm down the breathing as just observing that the breathing does calm down. If you maintain this practice for a while, you will find that the breathing becomes more calm. It becomes more subtle. And this is <laughs> unusual. Normally if you concentrate deeply on something, the object becomes stronger and stronger in your mind. But in the case of mindfulness of breathing, the breath becomes more and more subtle. And then people start to think, ah, I've stopped breathing. They've got to really work hard to, to find the breath again. So this is the the practice of samatha meditation with reference to the breathing, the in-breath and the out-breath. Next there comes a paragraph which switches to vipassana meditation. We call this the refrain. This refrain occurs at the end of each section. So now, the meditator lives observing the activities of the body internally or externally. What does that mean? Nobody got a guess? It 
I think is usually interpreted as referring to the fact that just as I am breathing in and breathing out, so there are other beings also breathing in and breathing out. This doesn't mean that if you're sitting in a group, you try to tune in to the breathing of the person sitting on the cushion next to you. It's just that you are aware that breathing is taking place in this body and it's also taking place in other bodies. You may wonder why is that worth doing? The purpose of this, one of the purposes of this practice is to depersonify this experience. It's not me, 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 I, 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 I am breathing, I am breathing. In the case of your own breathing, you should be just observing breathing. Not me breathing, just breathing. Breathing is going on. And also, breathing is going on in other beings as well. So there's no identification with a self. It's not that I am watching myself breathing. Or I am breathing. It is just breathing taking place. That way you are trying to weaken attachment to the concept of me, mine, myself. And he also, sorry, he, he lives, oh sorry, I dropped the Will this thing still be working okay, Thomas? I dropped them. Uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? Okay, fine, good. Um, so he, he lives observing the, irid, the origination factors in the body. This means being aware that due to there being a body and the breathing or the process of breathing and the uh, the concept of, or, or, no, not really concept, or, or, or mind. These are responsible for the origination of the breathing process. So these are origination factors. So we can understand that the breathing is a caused condition. It arises due to causes. And it will cease if and when these causes cease. If you remember back to the class a couple of weeks ago when we talked about dependent origination. Everything arises in dependence upon something else. The breathing can only arise in dependence upon something else. And if these factors are not present, then the breathing can't take place. So they are both origination factors and dissolution factors. Or we can be observing both origination and dissolution factors in the body. Or his mindfulness is established to the extent necessary just for knowledge 
and awareness that the body exists. Not his body exists, but the body exists. So in Vipassana meditation, you're just observing mindfully, but not with personal identification with either the body or the breathing. It's not my body, it's not my breathing, it is just a process, an impersonal process, which is going on and on, flowing on. So, his mindfulness is established to the extent necessary just for knowledge and awareness that the body exists, and he lives unattached and clings to naught in the world. In this way, because a bhikkhu lives observing the activities of the body. So, it's just observation. No personal involvement. Just watching. Observing. Observing with understanding. Then we embark upon some of the other objects which can be taken. The second area, the postures of the body. There are four possible postures. Standing, sitting, walking and lying down. So you can be aware of the posture of your body. So, and further, because a bhikkhu knows when he's going, I am going. We don't normally do that. When you are walking along the street, you are probably thinking about what you are going to do when you get to your destination. If you're going to the, to the supermarket, you're thinking about what, what goods you must buy in the supermarket. If you're walking towards the the train station, you're thinking about, I wonder if I'm going to be on time to get the train or not. You're wondering about all sorts of things, but you're not paying attention to the process of walking. And there's a whole meditation practice concerned with observation of walking. Usually this is done by walking slowly, and paying very close attention to each of the movements that take place. Lifting the foot, moving the foot forwards, placing the foot, transferring the weight onto that foot, lifting the back foot, moving that forward, putting it down, transferring the weight onto that foot. In fact, you've become even more aware that each movement is preceded by an intention in the mind. I make the intention to lift my foot. I do that. I now have the intention to move the foot forwards. I do that. So, you can slow down this process again just paying bare attention to it. Just watching. And then he knows when he is standing, I am standing. You can be aware when you're standing. What are the sensations you're experiencing in the body? You feel the pressure of your feet on the ground? And then when he's sitting, he knows he is sitting, and when he's lying down, he knows I am lying down. So you've got four postures you can choose to be aware of. And again, we have this refrain 
Thus he lives observing the activities of the body internally, externally, etc., etc., just as we had at the end of the uh, part about breathing. Then the third area. And further, because the bhikkhu applies full attention either in going forward or back, in looking straight on or looking away, in bending or in stretching, in wearing robes or carrying the bowl. So you're being aware of what you're doing from moment to moment. In eating, drinking, chewing, or savouring. That's a whole meditation practice. Um, if, you, if, you, if you sit at your, the table eating your food, you don't just shovel the stuff in and thinking about something else. You pay very careful attention. The lifting of the food up to the mouth, the placing of the food in the mouth, the process of chewing the food, and the swallowing of the food. In attending to the calls of nature, in walking, in standing, in sitting, in falling asleep, in waking. So you can be mindful from the moment you wake in the morning until the moment you go to sleep at night. That's quite a tall order, so you may not be able to do that immediately. But that is, he's making the point that there is never a moment when you cannot be mindful. So in speaking or in keeping silence, in all these he applies full attention. And thus he lives observing the activities of the body, internally, externally, etc., etc., etc. The fourth section is called the repulsiveness of the body. Starting with external parts of the body and then going into the internal organs. And further, because a bhikkhu reflects on this very body enveloped by the skin and full of manifold impurity from the soul up and from the top of the head down, thinking thus, there are in this body hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, that's all external, sinews, bones, marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, midriff, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, stomach, feces, bile, and now we're going into the more liquid parts, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, saliva, nasal mucus, synovial fluid, and urine. Hmm. Why is it? What's the value of all this? A, a, soup, a soup of fruit. Yes, sort of. Yes, it is to try to realize that the body is not such an attractive thing after all. We spent a lot of time beautifying the body. We put on clothes that make it look beautiful. We may decorate the body in various ways. We may use pleasant uh, fragrances. So this is a, a practice particularly suitable for somebody with a lustful disposition. 
to try to realize that this body is not as delightful and attractive as we might think it should be. It's also a means of disidentifying with the body. If you break down the body into these various constituent parts, where is the me, where is the I in all of this? I haven't got one. But the Buddha gives us an analogy. Just as if there were a double-mouthed provision bag full of various kinds of grain, such as hill paddy, paddy, green gram, cow peas, sesame, and husked rice, and a man with sound eyes, having opened that bag, were to reflect thus. This is hill paddy, this is paddy, this is green gram, this is cow pea, this is sesame, this is husked rice. Just so because a bhikkhu reflects on this very body, enveloped by the skin and full of manifold impurity, from the soul up and from the top of the hair down, thinking thus, there are in this body, head, hair, hair of the body, etc, etc, etc. There's an interesting thing about this analogy. When you think about various kinds of grain, such as hill, paddy, paddy, green grams, cowpeas, etc, etc, do you feel any sense of repulsion towards those? No. So, when we think about the different parts of the body, the purpose of the practice is to overcome attachment, but not to develop repulsion. There's a little difference here. This is just observing the different parts of the body, but not necessarily filling your mind with aversion towards them. And then, section five, material objects. A bhikkhu reflects on this very body as it is, as it is constituted, by way of the material elements. There are in this body the element of earth, the element of water, the element of fire, and the element of wind. The last of these 40 objects, the four elements. It's not so much the, the presence of things like fire, um, it is their functions. Solidity, fluidity, heat and motion. These four are present in any material object to a greater or lesser extent. If you take um, water, the element of fluidity is very strong. There will also be an element of solidity, because if you smack your hand down on the water, you can feel there's a solid element there. And the water will have a temperature and movement. If you lower the temperature of the water so that the fire element is much reduced, the fluid, the fluidity is also much reduced, but the solidity, the earth element, increases. And there you've got a block of ice. So these four elements 
are fluctuating, but every material object is made up of these four. And so that can also be used as a means of, or as a source of um, meditation practice. Just as if because a clever cow butcher or his apprentice, having slaughtered a cow and divided it into portions, would be sitting at the junction of four high roads. In the same way a bhikkhu reflects on this very body as it is, and it is constituted by way of material elements. There are in this body the elements of earth, water, fire and wind. What we're trying to understand here is that any material body is made up of these four elements. That is all. We may ascribe to this combination some label designating it as a cow. But the Buddha makes the point, once the cow butcher has done his job, you've got a head, feet, tail, where's your cow? There wasn't a real cow. The cow was a construction in your mind. The cow doesn't have some kind of independent existence. Any more than in today's parlance we might say a motor car. A motor car doesn't have independent existence. It is a combination of thousands of parts put together in a particular way. But once you've taken the car to pieces, you don't have a car any longer. And with our own body, we tend to think of this as, this is my body. But again, it is only a combination of these four elements, nothing more. We ascribe to it a degree of solidity a degree of independent existence, which we can then talk about as my body. But that's purely an artificial or mental construct. Shall we take a little break for tea? <laughs>